So, this is, um, I'm going to share a bit uh, the, my, my experiences coming from um, a very different uh, world to um, web development. Uh, first of all, I want to make a disclaimer. Uh, it's not about how to love back code, that's a, a marketing name. It's going to be more how to like back code, or more precisely, how to accept bad code in our projects. Um, personally, I think it's, it's very difficult to, to, to love impossible bad code, especially when it's not used, but from others. You're working in a, in a, in a project. It's so, first things first, um, who am I? Uh, I'm an engineer. Um, I come from building airplanes, that type of things. Um, Another one, this is the, the latest one before I left it uh, for good to get involved with web development. Um, also, I'm a Drupalier. I'm Kurkuma in the D.O. user, and I've been doing Drupal stuff from 4.7 to now. Um, this is not the latest presentation. Sorry about this. to live with that. Probably there are some things missing, but um, hope will be okay. Um, I was working in, in Spain. I was working all over the world when I was in engineering, and when I moved to Britain, uh, I work in the Tate website, just as, as an example of things I've done recently, and now I'm working for OpenBet, uh, gaming gambling industry. Uh, it's an interesting change from museums to gambling. Um, well, uh, I'm going to draw a little bit about the, the, the few things I learned when I was doing engineering and, and how we uh, should, uh, well, how can we leverage them um, to improve our web development. The first is uh, what I call the engineering di dilemma. Basically, uh, it's not happening only in engineering, it's with everything we try to do projects with optimization of resources. That's a um, fancy word to say that we try to build the best possible with the lowest budget, which is as well a fancy name to say that we excel at making stuff as badly as possible, but not worse. Um, the, amazing, the amazing thing of all of this is that it works. It works. We build, at least in engineering, uh, fantastic things build in, as I say, the, the, the as badly as possible, but just there. So that's something interesting that uh, um, I've, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, to leverage in, in web development and in my projects around Drupal. Um, yeah, well, this is a, a, a funny quote about uh, Armageddon, you know, uh, which reflects exactly that. You are being thrust into the, uh, basically, uh, on top of something built by the lowest bidder, full of, uh, it's a living bomb, in fact. Other, other things in engineering that, well, probably everybody is, is, is aware uh, of is um, emergent properties. Um, we build machines. We build, in this case, beautiful machines. Um, but a fun, interesting thing, like, like in software, I guess, is that uh, you know? Although uh, they must be really nice pieces of machinery as a whole, they are made uh, uh, by by the careful combination of imperfect and many times badly components, bad components, uh, not the best components individually. The trick in engineering is uh, just to make just to choose the components so they work well together. You don't have to choose the best ones, you have to choose the right ones. Um, and it works as well. Uh, yeah, and as we see, the whole is more than the sum of the parts. And if you look at the list of components of, 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 of any uh, 
uh, complex machine engineered is, is probably you will find that in many times, in many places they use uh, uh, components of lower uh, standards, lower quality, or maybe there are bet better options are out there. But the whole thing um, works pretty well. Also, uh, from engineering, uh, <laughs> I learned a bit about failure in complex systems. We have at the moment what we call hyper-complex systems. It's very, very, very much what we have in, in, in software. Um, in my case, I was working in, in jet engines. Jet engines at this moment is, are really complicated. Um, so we try to optimize uh, the behavior of all the parts and to, and to reduce the single point of failure by removing catastrophic par uh, failure of the parts. The problem is that with such a complex systems, um, a small failures, combination of, of a small failures may lead to a catastrophic one. Normally this is what happens when um, an airplane falls. Um, there are a chain of, of small failures that are undetected or, or the combination hasn't been assessed and altogether form a catastrophic failure and then you have a, a, a big problem. Uh, but, but we, uh, in engineering, uh, we learn to, to, to deal with that. We learn to live with that. And we assume that all systems, this complex, are going to run in a degraded mode. All systems are running with a system, uh, a series of errors constantly happening everywhere. Um, that's why in, in engineering we have people. Uh, basically, uh, they are there to control that uh, the errors are, um, uh, or the failures are uh, not, not going wild. You know? Also, new changes introduce new forms of failure. Um, that's obvious, but uh, in engineering, uh, things are very static. Uh, we make an airplane, and the airplane lives for 20 years, and the changes are fairly small for to prevent things like this and because it's very expensive to to change things once they are in that's why i left engineering because it was very slow um, that doesn't happen in software but that pr presents other other problems uh, for us and as i said at the beginning it is impossible to predict the failure of such a complex system we can monitor that and um, hope for the best but um, a priori is, is very, 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 very difficult. So um, what lessons I got from, from engineering? As I say, failure is unavoidable. Your systems are going to fail. You want it or not, sooner or later. There will be cases to, that you haven't considered. They are going to fail. We have to be prepared for that. Uh, the components you are going to use are frequently bad uh, because you cannot build everything yourself. You'll have to... Um, You'll have to uh, uh, push things out of your of, of, of your own control, and well, you know, who knows what the contractors are doing? They tell you one thing, and they do other things. Um, that happens, I guess, in all all industries. That happened to me, in in both industries. So uh, <laughs> um, that's why the lawyers are for. Uh, as I said, the, the whole thing was better than, than, than the parts, the projects, uh, as done as badly as possible. And whoops, we have to learn from all mistakes, all the time, all, all the time. And that's something, um, specifically in the aeronautic industry, is religious, is fanatical, is very important. Obviously, because failure is very expensive, because failure means lots of people dead, and, and many times airplanes um, um, in ground to be retrofitted, thousands and millions of dollars lost uh, every day. Um, and, and, and the aeronautic industry specifically is, is absolutely fanatical about learning from the mistakes. And I think that's something that, that we have to do. We'll see it uh, now. So just, just briefly, how, how do we make airplanes? Just to summarize this. First, um, we model the whole system. Um, in this case, jet engines. We model um, 
what the, what the engine is going to be, what the performance is going to be, um, what the interactions are going to be, the parts, the sections. Um, it's, a, it's a very loose model that, that determines how everything is going to work after. And this is very important. Lots of work is put here for months before an engine starts and has great advantages. Then we define the interfaces, the physical interfaces between the components, and I think this is critical. Um, the engine is sliced. I don't know if any one of you have seen a, a, a jet engine. They are sliced, and between each slice there are physical components, mechanical, electrical, between, between the parts, and they are defined at the beginning. And every part of every company participating in the manufacturing of the whole thing uh, respects the interfaces. That's the only thing they have to do. You have to build you the slice. <coughs> you have to um, uh, achieve the, the behavior that was uh, declared at the beginning. Everything is based in, 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 in previous knowledge and history and so on. But, but you have to respect your interfaces. Well, as long as you do that, everybody will be happy. So, uh, and then we distribute the components. We slice the engine. We bring... Um, um, partners in, sell whatever, and the components are built independently, as anyone likes, with different technologies, different processes, different everything, except that the interfaces, you don't touch them. It's, 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 <laughs> it's a problem when someone detects a problem with an interface, because it has changed a lot of changes. And then we assemble the components, and we fly. And we learn from what happens when we are flying, and we retrofeed our processes. This is very important because that's happening all the time. Um, and I think we can, we can build software, uh, specifically uh, 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 web software, following a very, very similar pattern and, and will we'll have from uh, loads of benefits. I'm going to the software. Well, the good, the bad, and the ugly code. First, some, some I'm going to explain how I understand some things so everyone knows um, where I am with this. What is bad? What is good code? Obviously, it depends who you are. If you are a project manager, you want to deliver. You want to fulfill the functional specifications and deliver. Don't show me what is inside the black box. Don't do it. Uh, yeah. And, and Probably this is, the, this is the best way, because if the project manager has been a developer and looks into the, into the black box, that's bad news. But that's another story. If you're a developer, I don't know, maybe you just want to have fun. That's what I wanted. I just want to code. This is fun. Yeah, great. Um, I don't want to spend two-thirds of my time documenting, testing, interacting with other, no, 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 I just want to sit here with my music and just write code and, you know, be amazed with all the new things I'm learning and blah, blah. Yeah, probably not very good code will come from that. And the end, uh, if you are a maintainer, you want code that you can understand, that you can maintain and that you can support, yeah? This, I would say, is the only valid measure for good code in the long term, like in engineering. After you have finished the, 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 the process, the product you deliver, uh, you spend a lot of money and a lot of time uh, giving support and, and maintenance to the project. 40 and 80% is a figure completely made up, but uh, it makes sense to me. Um, so, so, yeah, uh, about how to code, yes, remember this if you are a developer, remember this. Um, you know, who is going to maintain your code could be a psychopath and, and know where you live, so be careful with that. So yeah, um, probably the, the, the two of the three approaches that we say that we are going to produce bad code in one way or another. The, the truth of the matter is that bad code is what we fancily call uh, technical debt. Uh, bad code is unavoidable because of project limitations. Any project with, with any sort of, of restriction is going to, uh, sooner or later, uh, uh, push bad code out of the project. Uh, all of you have worked on that, and I think I'm not saying anything that uh, 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 anyone doesn't know and hasn't, hasn't experienced yet. yet. 
Uh, therefore, the technical debt is unavoidable. But uh, as Linus Torvald says here, um, bad programmers worry about the code. Good programmers worry about data structures and their relationships. That's taking me links with what I said about the physical interfaces of engineering. And, and define what, for me, are the two types of technical debt where we are going to focus uh, as software. One is cheap technical debt. That's code for a component, a component that is going to be isolated. That's cheap. We can pay it off without destroying the project somewhere in the future. And the other is expensive, is messing up with the architecture of the system, not defining the engineering, the, the, say, the, the interfaces between the slices and the engine well. That's expensive. That's going to mess up everything. And, well, remember that the technical debt is always, always paid by someone. And sometimes it may be that psychopath that we mentioned before. So um, the funny thing um, is that uh, I, I, I find this, that there's an interesting paradox in software because Uh, specifically, uh, I don't know, the web software industry is, is, is very dynamic. It's very easy to change things. It's, uh, but, but, but seems to me more prone to failure than real world engineering. It's, it's maybe the, the, the being it so easy, fast and cheap to fix things make us, um, um, make us be a little bit more careless. I don't know. Um, example, uh, whatever, code deployed to the servers, everything seems fine. In production, there's problems of, of performance. Oh my God, oh my God, we go there, spend a few hours looking at stuff, we find out what it is. I don't know, my SQL configuration parameters were wrong because the system administrator of the performance system or the, of the production system for the client didn't read our, our instructions or, or whatever. Um, we patch the information there, we pack up things and we go home. I've seen that many times. Uh, it's very easy to do that. Uh, it's, it's, it's a cheap failure. Uh, okay, your client may be with the web down. Mm, the, 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 the clients of a client may not receive mails for a couple of hours, but all of that is cheap. It's very cheap. Nobody's going to die, no things are going to crash, and it's very easy and very fast to, to do. So my experience here is that we are, in general, careless. We don't take this religiously, whatever we have learned there. And that's what we do in engineering. So do we really learn from our mistakes? You know, fanatically, no, I don't think so. That's one of the things that uh, um, we have to bring from engineering, from really, really, really taking everything seriously. Um, specifically in the in the aeronautic industry, uh, we work with checklists. We have checklists for absolutely everything, um, and that's something that I, I implement in in the teams I work with. It's difficult because people are very annoyed by uh, following checklists. But uh, well, yeah, and and uh, as I said uh, as I said before. Uh, the software industry is really complicated. We have thousands of lines of code, I don't know, millions, whatever. Lots of developers working uh, independently. Is, is what, what makes it so cheap and so fast probably makes it so extra complicated. So, and here is what I have to say. What to do? Well, basically make sure that you limit your expensive technical debt, that you don't have expensive technical debt. That's probably the, 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 the most thing, the, the main thing I try to do. So invest in good architecture, invest in that, spend your money there and stick to it. Again, do it again and still again. This is, this is very important. Uh, uh, a good start, a solid foundation will be good. And from, from that good definition of the um, uh, architecture, it will come the, the component interfaces for a system well-defined. 
and be fanatical about learning from our mistakes. Be really, really, really careful about that. Feedback constantly. Uh, keep documentation, even if it's your own documentation. Anything you, you find out, uh, note it down. Anything your team finds out, note it down. If someone fixes a bug in a certain chase them till they uh, feedback the rest of the team. It's, that's, that's absolutely vital. Um, I'm saying this because um, I've seen the opposite case too many times in, in specifically in, in web software industries. And maybe I'm, I'm a strange case, but uh, I wouldn't say so. So as I said, um, to me, this is the, the absolutely the most important bit to to um, to do in a project. Uh, if you have that right, if you have absolutely right, you are going to build on top of technical uh, uh, solid foundations. But unfortunately, especially in big projects where lots of people are in and out, contractors come in and out. I've been in those as well. Uh, the software looks like like a massive pyramid. It's like loads of, of, of code pile on top of, of each other. Um, architectural changes made all the way uh, uh, halfway through the project and, and basically it, it stands up because of, of the massive uh, uh, force of, of human beings thrown to that. So with that we'll limit our, our technical depth to the cheap one and the only thing that we have to do is that they respect our APIs. Uh, our APIs, our, our interfaces, uh, will be the equivalent to the, to the physical interfaces. We'll have to be absolutely adamant on that. If we do that, we can, lo we can love that code. We can live with that code, or much better. We can stop about carrying that code. We may have that code inside components. It may not work fast, may not uh, be super performant, but if they respect um, the communication with basically setting up the architecture, it comes to that, uh, set up communication rules and stick to that. If they respect that, if they respect the interfaces, if they respect the, 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 the data exchange established, we don't care if the code is that bad. If that's bad, we'll, we'll, we'll contract another company to do that specific bit. Um, Basically, um, that's it. Um, if you just want one rule, it, it boils down to this. Most of problems in life come from poor communication in life with my wife, with my friends, with my boss. I don't know, with people, everything comes to bad communication. It's the same in engineering. The communication between the components are the physical interfaces I did. Oops. Uh, so define your communication protocol and uh, stick to it. One thing that comes to me after saying this is, what about Agile? We want to do Agile from the beginning and so on. Um, I would rather do Agile, uh, waterfall Agile, um, following uh, the engineering methods. I've been trained as a hardcore engineer, probably I won't be able to escape that, that, that thing burned into my brain with fire. Uh, but uh, I think it allows for cheaper teams. Um, in an agile team, for the team to be fantastic, uh, everyone has to be uh, uh, pretty much up to, uh, up to a, a fairly decent level, especially if you want to do architecture in an agile way as you go along. And that's going to be expensive and even if you get really good guys uh, they are going to mess it up I've done it myself so uh, I'm not uh, uh, that good or, or yes well you don't know me <laughs> um, architecting up front is going to be always difficult the solution in the aeronautic en engineering is like this works so we'll spend months there before we start kicking uh, parts out that's a very waterfall part of the process. But everything after that is going to, you know, all the, all the rest of the components are going to be in an agile way, in whatever way. But 
Uh, if you have a little bit of experience on that, the first time is going to be more difficult, the next time is going to take you less time, you are going to learn from your mistakes, you are going to take your notes, and the next uh, bit of architecture you do is going to be more polished. So it eventually pays, pays, pays off. So yeah, um, that's what I, I, I like to do. Waterfall architecture and agile build of components. Oh, yeah, uh, but the, in, in any case, in any case, in any case, remember that bad code is the beginning of good code. So uh, be gentle with, <laughs> with your developers. Um, that's it. I think I've done pretty well, very fast. Yes, and we have some time for questions. <laughs>